what a blessing it is for us to worship our Savior in music, in song, and what a blessing it is to worship our Savior as we study His Word. Let us pray. Oh, Father, thank You for the gift of Jesus. There would be no second coming without His first coming. And we are so thankful that Jesus came to this earth. Lord, He had a role to save us from sin. But Father, He also reveals our hearts. And so Lord, as we learn about Jesus today, I pray that you would reveal the secrets of our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There is a hymn entitled, Angels from the Realm of Glory. And verse one goes like this. Angels from the realm of glory, wing your flight o'er all the earth. Ye sang creation's story. Now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship. Come and worship. Worship Christ, the newborn King. The angels looked forward to seeing the Messiah. But there was one man who could not wait to see the Messiah. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, this is the third book of the New Testament, the third gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And if you ever want to read about the birth narrative of Jesus Christ in detail, study the first two chapters of the book of Luke. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 25, the Bible says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. We don't know much about this man, Simeon. We don't know where he was born. We don't know where Simeon was from. We don't know what Simeon did for a living. We don't know very much, but in the little that we do know about Simeon, we know that Simeon was a man who walked with God. And I don't know about you, but if I died before Jesus Christ comes, the greatest legacy that I can leave behind is this. Nestor was a man who walked with God. Simeon was a just and a fair man. He was a man who always did what was right. Everyone around town knew that he was humble, that he was pious. Everyone knew that he was devout and a God-fearing man. He was a man who studied the scriptures. He was a man who loved studying the word. He was eagerly waiting for the consolation of Israel. The Jews had a special prayer that they would sing, and they would, the prayer would go like this, May I see the consolation of Israel, which meant, may I live to see the Messiah. And like a child who can't wait to open his gift under the Christmas tree, Simeon could not wait to see Jesus Christ. And the Bible continues in verse 26. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Simeon walked so close to God that God's Spirit made a promise to him. You will see Christ before you die. One day, Joseph and Mary brought the child to the temple. It was a custom for parents during that time to circumcise their firstborn male child and then bring the child to the temple to be consecrated before the Lord. Simeon went to the temple that same day and he saw this special newborn child. And he thought to himself, could this be the Messiah? Could this be the promised one? 
A flood of joy rushes into his soul as he realizes that he is holding in his arms the very promised Messiah. And Simeon blesses the Lord when one of the most beautiful prayers that you can ever read in Scripture. The Bible says in verse 29, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. I like how Ellen Wright writes in Review and Herald, April 2, 1901. She says, Next slide, joy and exaltation trans transfigured his face as he held in his arms God's most precious gift to men. His illumined mind received the light flowing from the source of all light. He saw that Christ was to be the hope of the Gentiles as well as of the Jews. The walls of tradition built up by Jewish prejudice did not exist in his mind. Here's his last line. He realized that the Messiah was to bring redemption to all. This was the Messiah. This was the Redeemer of all people. And Joseph and Mary, they marvel at these sunny yet solemn words. Simeon turns to Joseph and Mary, and he blesses them as well. And then he speaks privately to Mary. And look what he says to her, verse 34. Then, then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Mary, listen. This child whom you hold in your hands, he is the Savior and he is the Redeemer. But I want you to know something. I want you to know that he has been appointed to cause many of God's people to either rise or fall. He is God's sign of salvation, but Mary, he is going to be opposed. Mary, you will feel as though a sword is being pierced right through your heart when you see your son, Jesus, being rejected. But Mary, this has to happen in order that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Mary, this has to happen because God wants to reveal the true nature of our hearts. The grand purpose of God, what is the purpose of God sending His Son, Jesus Christ? The grand purpose of God sending His Son, Jesus, is to save the world from the penalty and power of sin. That's Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. But how does God accomplish this? How does He begin this process of saving us from sin? What does Jesus do to save us from this disease of sin? That's a good question. We get a clue in that last part of verse 35. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There's our clue. In other words, Jesus brings to surface the true nature of our hearts. Jesus Christ brings to surface our deepest thoughts and affections about God. Jesus reveals the truth of your heart and the truth of my heart. He makes evident those who really love Him and those who really don't. Now you might be thinking, why does He do this? Why does Jesus reveal the truth of our hearts? Well, there are at least three reasons that I'd like to share with you this morning. Reason number one, the first reason why Jesus reveals the truth of our hearts is to reveal who really loves Him, to reveal who really loves Him. There is no such thing as a secret Christian. You are either for Jesus or you are against Jesus. There is no middle ground. Jesus came to reveal who is for him and who is against him. You remember in verse 34 what Simeon said, then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and what? 
and rising of many in Israel. Simeon was prophesying. You know what he was saying? Jesus is destined, in other words, he's appointed for two things. One, the fall of many of people in Israel, these people who reject him, and also the rise of many people, those who would accept him. I like how Ma Matthew Henry contrasts these two groups. Look what he says in his commentary. The secret good affections in the minds of some will be revealed by their embracing of Christ. The secret corruptions of others will be revealed by their enmity to Christ. The secret good affections in the minds of some will be revealed by their embracing Christ. The secret corruptions of others will be revealed by their enmity to Christ. And do you know where these two parties showed their true colors? They showed their true colors at the cross. Verse 34 continues. Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. And then he says to Mary, yes, a sword will pierce through your soul also. Jesus was opposed. The epitome of rejection was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, these teachers of the law, Satan, and all his evil hosts, they poured upon Jesus all the contempt and hatred they could muster. Let's get, let's get rid of him. Let's get rid of him. Behold the Lamb of God, betrayed by his very own people. Mary watched as her very own son hung limp on the cross. And she felt as if a sword pierced through her own heart. Jesus was revealed his enemies to the entire universe. He exposed those who were against him. But there were some people who were not against Jesus. There were some people who were on Jesus' side. Mary, poor Mary, she was disheartened beyond despair because she still loved Jesus. She was on his side. Jesus looked around, is there anyone else who's still on my side? He saw his disciples, all 11 of them. They were confused, they were dumbfounded. This was their friend, this was their master. This was their king, nailed to a cross. They kept their distance for fear of the Jews. But they still loved Jesus. They were on his side. Nicodemus, that bright Pharisee, ruler of the Jews, all of his colleagues reviled Jesus, but he didn't say a word. He still loved Jesus. Nicodemus brought spices and aloes to give Jesus a proper burial because he was on his side. The death of Jesus revealed his true friends. And today, Jesus reveals who really loves him. You know an enemy of Jesus. When you see, when you see, you know, you know an enemy of Jesus when you see one. Jesus reveals their true colors. An enemy of Jesus doesn't care for him. An enemy of Jesus can't stand the truth. An enemy of Christ finds Bible study and prayer boring. An enemy of Jesus refuses to accept him because she thinks life is more fun without God. An enemy of Jesus rejects him because Jesus convicts him of sin. But you know a friend, on the other hand, you know a friend of Jesus when you see one. Jesus reveals their true colors. A friend of Jesus loves church. A friend of Jesus loves prayer and loves the Bible. A friend of Jesus can't wait to tell someone about their best friend, Jesus. A friend of Jesus enjoys helping people who are in need. A friend of Jesus keeps his mind pure. Jesus reveals the truth of our hearts to reveal who really loves him. But not only that, Jesus reveals the truth of our hearts to disclose our true condition. Jesus wants us to know our true condition. Now, let's be honest. We pat ourselves on the back when we do good things. You, I went to church today. Good job. Good job. I bought all my grandkids, all 10 of them, presents for Christmas. It's all under the Christmas tree. Good job. I shoveled my neighbor's driveway. 
1,000 points for me. I've attended church all my life and I have never done anything bad. I sit, I've been sitting in the same spot for the last 15 years. I am awesome. The reality is we think we are okay when we do good deeds, but here is a word for us from the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. The Bible says, next line, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Be careful when you think you're all right, lest you fall flat on your face. Another verse, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. This literally means all of our righteousness is like a woman's garment when she has her period. That's what the text means. Which means all of our best efforts does not produce righteousness. It produces imperfection. Jesus reveals the truth of our hearts so that we can know our true condition. We are not as good as we think we are. We are sick in need of a physician. We are dirty in need of a cleaner. We are lost in need of a savior. We are dead in need of the life giver. Can you say amen? This is our true condition. You know, I can't speak from experience because I don't have a child. I can only watch my sister and friends who have children. But what I, do, what I do know, as I observe parents who have children, I do know this, that having a child, just like marriage, by the way, but having a child reveals how selfish we really are. Isn't that true, parents? Some think this thought, mm, I can't get much sleep. When was the last time I got at least six hours of sleep? I can't get any sleep. Or they think, my life will never be normal again. Or they think, all my money is being spent on my child. Mercy. Or they think, will I ever have alone time with my spouse again? I mean, these kids are just hanging on to me every hour of the day. This is what children do. This is the reality. This is what children do. And this is what the Christ child does. The Christ child reveals how selfish we are. When we look at the innocent child, Jesus Christ, we realize that we are not so innocent. It is because of our selfishness that Jesus came and died. The Christ in the manger reveals that we are in danger and that we are in need of a Savior. How has Jesus been speaking to you? Do you sense your danger? That's the work of Jesus. To bring to surface your thoughts about Jesus. Jesus reveals the truth of our hearts to reveal who really loves him, number one. Jesus reveals the truth of our hearts to disclose our true condition, number two. And last but not least, Jesus reveals the truth of our hearts to change our hearts. To change our hearts. Jesus does not reveal that we have a disease and leave us hanging. That is good news, friends. Jesus diagnoses us, and he also treats us. He shows us that we've had a great fall, and he can put us back together again, unlike Humpty Dumpty. I like this phrase, this statement, this, this passage in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. That's the work of Jesus, to search our hearts. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any way, wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Jesus, he searches us. He shows us the true nature of our hearts and we see that we are rotten. We see that we have rejected him. But not only does he diagnose our problem, he helps us and he leads us in the way everlasting. Can you say amen? He reveals that you have a stony heart and you know what he does? He does open heart surgery. He removes the stony heart out of your chest, cut it open, this big st stony rocky heart, and he gives you a soft beating heart of flesh. Now you might be thinking, how does God change our hearts? Come on, how does that happen? It sounds good in theory, Pastor, but how does God begin this process 
of giving me a new heart? You know what my answer is? It's in one word, forgiveness. That's how he begins the transformation of our hearts, forgiveness. You remember the story of Mary Magdalene. I invite you to turn with me just a few chapters later to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, beginning with verse 36. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And this was Simon, the Pharisee. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. Verse 37. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, verse 38, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet, anointed them, and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now, why in the world would this woman come wash his feet with her hair, and anoint his feet with oil. The answer is found in verse 44, in the next section. Verse 44, Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and ga you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet and her with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Verse 47, therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. The literal Greek, in the Greek it, it's, it means, it's, it translates, her sins have been forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same, little, the same loves little. Verse 48, then he said to her, your sins are forgiven, or your sins have been forgiven. We know that her sins have been forgiven because she's coming and she's lavishing Jesus' feet with all of her love. Look at the next two verses, verse 49, and those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And please listen to verse 50. You don't want to miss this. Then he said to the woman, your, safe, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Beloved, if you have been forgiven much, you will go in peace. Hallelujah. Forgiveness is freedom. Forgiveness is freedom. You don't have to live by the chains of bondage and anger and resentment. Forgiveness is freedom. You don't have to live by the chains of guilt. Forgiveness is freedom. And that's what Mary Magdalene experienced. She went in peace. Jesus changes our hearts by forgiving us. He frees us through forgiveness. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. How does someone go from being lost to being found? From being a wretch to being righteous? Answer, by receiving and enjoying the sweet forgiveness of Jesus. I don't want you to forget that freedom is, forgiveness is freedom. Forgiveness is freedom. Jesus can change your heart if you receive his forgiveness today. You can be overwhelmed with joy, my friends. You can be overwhelmed with joy. Just like Officer Vanderbroek. Just like Officer Vanderbroek. Bishop Tutu's Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa has unearthed some of the shocking stories of the history of apartheid. You know what happened in South Africa? Legalized racism. Among them, the one of a black South African woman who listened as white police officer acknowledged his part in the murder of her son. Officer Vanderbroek, before everyone in this court, rehearsed how he had shot the 18-year-old at point-blank range and then partied with other officers as they burned his body, 
turning it over and over in the flames until there was nothing but ashes. Eight years later, he returned with others and seized her husband. The time, this time, she was forced to watch as he returned. He was forced to watch as they bound him on a wood pile, poured gasoline over his body, and burned him alive. The last words she heard her husband say were, Forgive them. And so after relating his horror story, Officer Vanderbroek awaited judgment. He sat down in his seat. The judge turned to this widowed woman and he asked, what sentence do you want to give to Officer Vanderbroek? Do you know what the woman said? She said, I want three things. Number one, I want Officer Vanderbroek to take me to the place of my husband's ashes so I may gather them and give him a decent burial. And judge, number two, since my family is gone and I have so much love to give, I want Mr. Vanderbroek to come to the ghetto twice a month and spend the day with me so that I can be a mother to him. And judge one more thing, number three, I would like Mr. Vanderbroek to know that he is forgiven by God and that I forgive him too. And so that he can know my forgiveness is real and genuine. I would like before all of the people here to embrace him right now. And so this elderly woman, she left the stage and she started across the courtroom and the account says that Vanderbroek began to tremble. Someone in the group began singing amazing grace and the whole group sang that song as they watched this little old lady walk toward Mr. Officer Vanderbroek. Officer Vanderbroek watched as she was coming. He was trembling. And the account says that Officer Vanderbroek fainted. He fainted because of the love and forgiveness of this widowed woman. He was overwhelmed by this act and love of forgiveness. There's someone here today. You need a new heart. You need a new heart. You need God's forgiveness. There may be someone here who's thinking, I have gone so far that Jesus can't forgive me. I want to tell you there's nothing too bad that you have done that Jesus cannot forgive. Jesus he steps out of his throne and he walks slowly towards you and you can hear the words, you can hear the song Amazing Grace with his arms stretched out. The question is, will you and I today receive his awesome forgiveness? But there's someone else here with a hard heart today. You have been experiencing the forgiveness of God. But there's someone in your life that you know you need to extend forgiveness. This person has hurt you. I don't know how this person has hurt you, whether it's emotionally, physically, mentally. But I want you to know that Jesus can change your heart. Jesus, Jesus can change your heart just like the widow who forgave this officer. Jesus can give you the power to forgive. Forgiveness is freedom, my friends. Forgiveness is freedom. Receiving God's forgiveness is freedom, and giving God's forgiveness is freedom. And as Pastor Michael has been highlighting the last two Sabbaths, forgiveness in, forgiveness out. You receive the forgiveness of Christ, you extend that same forgiveness to those who have hurt you. There was a woman, her name is Karen O'Connor. She went after, there was a woman who went after Karen's husband, and married him. Karen said this, I thought about her, I dreamed about her, I saw her in every woman I met. Some had her name, Kathy was her name. Others, her deep set blue eyes or her curly dark hair, even the slightest resemblance turned my stomach into a knot. 
Weeks, months, years passed by. Was I never to be free of this woman who had gone after my husband and ultimately married him? I couldn't go on like this. The endless rage, resentment, guilt, and anger drained the life out of everything I did. And you know what Karen did? So Karen went to a long day seminar on forgiveness. And by the way, we're going to have a seminar here, January 9, in the cafeteria, Sabbath, during Sabbath school time, a seminar on forgiveness by our beloved family ministry. If there's someone here dealing with resentment and bitterness, January 9, mark in your calendars. The leader asked the group in this seminar to think of someone they needed to forgive. And you know who Karen thought about? Karen thought about Kathy. Who can't stand her. She struggled with the thought of forgiving her. Can I really forgive Kathy? But something inside of her said, it's, it's time to let go. It's time to let go. And I believe that was the, the voice of Jesus speaking. And listen to Karen's words. Please listen. I can't describe it. I don't know what happened or what prompted me at that moment to do something I had resisted so doggedly for months. All I know is that for the first time in four years, I completely surrendered to the Holy Spirit. I released my grip on Kathy, on my ex-husband, on myself. I let go of the anger, just like that. Within seconds, energy rushed through every cell of my body. My mind became alert. My heart lightened. Karen wrote a letter to Kathy after that experience. Kathy called her on the phone. Karen was shocked. Karen writes, Kar Kathy thanked me for the letter, and she acknowledged my courage in writing it. Then she told me how sorry she was for everything. She talked briefly about her regret, her sadness for me, and more. And listen to what she says. All I had ever wanted to hear from her, she said that day. Forgiveness is freedom. Forgiveness is freedom. Jesus can free you from the shackles of sin, and He can also free you from the shackles of anger and resentment. And this is the process. This is the first thing that He does to begin this process of changing your heart. Jesus he reveals the truth of our hearts to reveal those who really loves Him, to, to disclose our true condition, and to change our hearts with His sweet forgiveness. There's someone here who needs God's forgiveness. And by the way, this is the greatest gift you can ever receive during Christmas time. In fact, it's not just a one-day gift. It's a day you can get all 365 days of the year. There's someone here who's in need of God's forgiveness. There's also someone here who's saying, I, I hear what you're saying, Pastor, but I'm having a really hard time, and I just, I need God's power to be able to forgive someone who has wronged me. My friends, that's release, that's freedom. Just to give it to God and ask Him for power. There's someone who needs forgiveness from Jesus, and there's someone here who needs power to forgive someone. If that's you, Lord, forgive me. I need it. Or Lord, give me power to forgive someone. I can't do it in my own strength. If you belong to one of these two groups, Lord, forgive me. Or give me power to forgive someone. Would you raise your hand with me? Lord, that's me. I need you to forgive me. I need power to forgive someone. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There may be someone here who has been touched by the words of God. And you're thinking to yourself, wow, I was so moved by the Holy Spirit in this teaching on forgiveness. And I was also moved by that baptism from Tom Cleveland. Praise the Lord for that commitment. Maybe you're thinking, I have never made that commitment to be baptized, or I need to recommit my life through rebaptism like Tom. I'm not going to ask you to stand up out of your seat and come down the aisle. But what I will ask you is this if this is you who is saying that, Lord, I need to come and be baptized or rebaptized. Please speak with me or Pastor Michael. I'll be out here in the foyer after our choir sings, after the postlude. Speak to us. 
we would love to help you in your journey and walk alongside you in your journey with Jesus Christ. Jesus was born to save us, my friends. Jesus was born to reveal the truth of our hearts and to change our hearts. And I love that last line of our closing hymn, Good Christians Now Rejoice. Verse 3, please listen to these words on verse 3. Good Christians now rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye need not fear the grave. Jesus Christ was born to save, calls you one and calls you all to gain his everlasting hall. Christ was born to save. Christ was born to save. Christ was born to reveal the true nature of your heart, but he was also born to change your heart. Let Jesus change your heart this Christmas season. <clears throat> Stand and sing, Good Christians Now Rejoice. We sing because Christ came to save. And we sing and we rejoice in your name because you continue to save. And I pray, Lord, that you will continue to bring the secret affections of our hearts to service, that we would realize our condition and turn to Jesus, our Savior. In the name of Jesus Christ, let all of God's people say, Amen. 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 You may be seated and feel free to stay by as the choir sings the postlude.
Elizabeth and go tell it.